It is a gripping story of mass rebellion inside God's own church. It is an epic tale of a tiny loyal remnant fighting head to head against corrupt church leadership and winning. It is the biblical book of Micah. This prophecy foretells of a man who would shepherd a little flock through this betrayal. Hear the urgent warning and the spectacular vision contained in Micah's message next on The Key of David with Gerald Flurry. Greetings, everyone. The prophet Micah was a contemporary of the prophets Isaiah and Hosea, and he uh, wrote his book about uh, 750 B.C. His emphasis was on God's church or spiritual Israel, first of all, and then on the nations of Israel, which is much more than the little nation in the Middle East, as our book on the United States and Britain and prophecy explains. But it's also about a little remnant that did cling to God's truth and give a powerful message in this end time. Micah describes how evil this world is and the terrible problems that we have right now, especially in Britain and America and the Jewish nation in the Middle East. But most of all, and most importantly, he, he describes our uh, extraordinary human potential, that mind-staggering potential that millions of people can't believe simply because it's so awesome. Now, you, I'll show you that, and especially one scripture today that ought to stop you in your tracks because it is phenomenal. It's aimed squarely at you and me, and uh, it's in Micah, one of, which is called one of the minor prophets. But let me tell you, there's nothing minor about Micah's message. Nothing minor at all. It is one of the most inspiring books in the Old Testament, even though it's a small little book. But what a powerful message it has. And uh, today I'd like to talk to you about Micah and your astounding potential, which is uh, discussed in his book, in his prophecy. But first I'd like to go back to a Bible verse that has not been understood by uh, our commentaries or our translators, and it's aimed directly at you today. Let's turn to Micah 2 verses 12 and 13. God says through the prophet Micah, here, here's what he's talking about, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of you. Now Jacob, of course, is the name of Israel before he was converted. So he's talking about unconverted nations of Jacob or Israel. They're unconverted. And I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. That's uh, here talking about spiritual Israel and a little remnant that delivers God's message in this end time. And it goes on to say, I will put them together as the sheep of Basra. And a little further down it says, the breaker, the breaker has come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out of it, and their king shall pass before them and the Lord at the head of them. In other words, the God leads that leader. The, the Hebrew word melech for king uh, has a wide range of, uh, of uh, translations. And so we have, to, we have to realize it could be something other than king. So if we're looking at spiritual Israel, and you'll see that as we go through here, the context will reveal to you what this is, that, it, that it's not really addressing a king, but it's addressing a spiritual leader and one that uh, you need to be aware of. There is a time frame here, and it's actually addressing a prophet and not a king, because it is the leader of of God's church, God's people, and they're delivering a message of prophecy, as I'll show you in a moment. So the context tells you it shouldn't be a king uh, at all. That's not what God is talking about, a king at least as we understand it today. 
And we have a booklet on who is that prophet that we'd like to send you, and it will explain all of that to you and who that, that prophet is in this last era of God's church. Ezekiel 33 and verse 33 talks about uh, when all of this comes to pass, then shall they know that a prophet was in their midst, a prophet with a prophecy from God. See, God is at the, is at the head. It's not the effort of a man, but it's God leading a man and delivering a message, and, and uh, that little remnant support the, work, the message of the prophet. So it's a work of God's people and a very important work. The, uh, the breaker, it, it says uh, in the San Sino, the breaker is gone up before them. They have broken forth and pressed on by the gate and uh, gone out. Then it says, and uh, the king is passed on before them and the eternal at the head of them. So this, again, this is a prophet, but is not a king. And it's a prophet, and it's a, it's a work of prophesying. The uh, Sonsino says this about Breaker, one who clears away, breaking down barriers and removing obstacles. So this obedient little remnant leaves God's church, which rises up as God's enemy, we'll see in a moment. The enemy of God, they don't just disobey, they fight against God. And we have a book on raising the ruins that will tell you the biggest battle they had against that little remnant fighting against God, even though they would never think that's the way it is. They weren't fighting the little remnant, they were fighting God because the little remnant was clinging to God's truth. And 95% of the people of God had left that truth. That's how sad this is. But let's go back to even verse 1. I'll just paraphrase it where God says, Hear all you people and hearken, O earth, hearken. And he's telling the whole earth to hearken. This is God speaking. It's not Micah. It's not a man today. It's God speaking His message and often through a man like Micah. But he says, we'd better, the whole earth is going to have to hearken to this. It's to the whole world. Notice verse 5, I'll just read a little bit of that. For the transgression of Jacob is in all this, and for the sins of the house of Israel. Now that, see again, Jacob, though, the, those are the nations of Israel, and the spiritual, spiritual Israel as well, which is uh, God's church. And most of them have turned away from God. Now, that's, there are many scriptures that tell you that. Verse 7 talks about burned with fire. This is a, a, just a terrible, terrifying warning to the whole world. This is about the whole world and nuclear fire, nuclear bombs. That's what it's all about. Verse 8, Therefore I will wail and howl. I will go stripped and naked I will make a wailing like the dragons and mourning as the owls. Now, what is that all about? I mean, here, this, this man Micah is really going to extremes when he's talking about wailing like uh, the dragons, it's really jackals. And a jackal, that's just a wild dog of Asia, North Africa, and they just make a, a, a wailing, piteous sound when they're in trouble or something is not right. That's the way it is. And then owls should be ostriches, really. The ostrich is a bird that, that has, God says has been deprived of wisdom uh, to illustrate how crazy we do things at times. The ostrich will just, if there's a crisis, will just run off and leave its young, young babies, and, uh, and let them fend for themselves or be destroyed or eaten. But it, he's, Micah's trying to get across how he wants to warn this in this message, and it's for this end time. And he has this extreme dedication. He said, look, I'll do all of this to make Israel understand, to make the nations of Israel and the world understand, and my church understand. I'll do all of that and do it as radically as possible. And people will say, well, that's being super radical. 
But look, he's talking about some extreme problems and the very problems that you see in this world today. The same problems. This is prophecy for right now. I mean the very last end, as the Bible says, uh, in Daniel. The very last end, just before the Messiah comes. And it's just, there's just such tremendously good news for us, if we will only heed it. Look at all the problems we have today. Nuclear proliferation everywhere you look, it seems. Especially in U.S., war against terrorism, and, and uh, we're almost $20 trillion in debt, which is just something your mind can't come to grips with. And it, it really, in most people's minds, it, it, it's just confusion. Or in their minds, that is. But drugs plague the U.S. and the U.K., uh, broken homes, out of control crime, all kinds of problems. And you can go ahead and read verse 16 where it says, God is going to enlarge your boldness as the eagle, like the bald eagle. He said, I'm going to enlarge that. You're going to go through problems and trials if you don't hearken to this message that's going to make you go bald. I mean, that's pretty uh, demonstrative if you think about it. That's something that ought to make us stop and think and ponder. This is God speaking, it's not a man. These are the words of God, and He even has birds. He's created birds anyhow for us to, to help us, well, in part, to com communicate His message and help people to see what He's talking about. It's, it's so critical that Micah said he would just strip naked or uh, wail like a, wail like a, uh, a jackal, and, or just whatever is necessary. But then verse 4 talks about in that day, that's always the end time. And then verse 5 says uh, it, it's talking to the congregation of the Lord, but it's talking to, to the congregation of God. This is about the spiritual Israel right now. That's the primary aim of this book. But he's also aiming it at the nations of Israel, explained in our book on the United States and Britain in prophecy. But look at the, again, the, in that day also is mentioned in Micah 7 and verse 11, and Micah 4 and verse 6, the very same expression. In that day, it's always when it expresses that it's always talking about the end time just before the coming of the Messiah. Then verse 6, notice this care carefully of Micah 2, Prophesy you not, say they to them that prophesy. They shall not prophesy to them that, that uh, they shall not take shame. So in other words, that 95% who turned against God is telling that little remnant, don't you prophesy, which is what they once did. But don't you do that. Don't you tell us that we'll take shame because we don't prophesy. But that little remnant goes right ahead and tells them, and must tell them, has to tell them if they're going to do their work. But look, if it is a work of prophecy, think about this, if it is a work of prophesying, then it must have a prophet at the head. There must be a prophet involved. If you're prophesying, that's what a prophet does. And then, of course, there's a little remnant to support that message, and they're excited about it and want to help and get the message out to this world. That's all happening right now. And that's the amazing thing about these prophecies. But again, if you just, it's not a king, it, the context tells you it's a prophet leading the people under. The, the head, Jesus Christ. That's what verse 13 is all about. Now let's look at verse 8. Verse 8, even of late, my people, God's church, His own church members, is risen up as an enemy. You pull off the robe with a garment, and from them that pass by securely as men averse from war. God's own church, it says, the Hebrew reads yesterday, like this is really very recent that it's happened. They've not only forsaken God, they stand up and fight against Him. And our book on the Raising the Ruins will explain that to you very vividly. 
Verse 10, Arise you and depart. Talking to that little remnant, depart, get out of that church, for this is not your rest. Because it is polluted, it shall destroy you, even with a sore destruction. That's a chilling warning. Arise and depart, get out of there. Don't stay in that polluted church. Verse, in the last part, For this is not your rest, because it is polluted, it shall destroy you even with a sore destruction. In other words, uh, it'll destroy you spiritually, but it's going to lead you into the Great Tribulation with all of those nuclear bombs and everything uh, ugly that you can imagine. That's the message here. But then, verse 13 again, the breaker has come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out of it. Micah 2 and verse 13. The New English Bible says, So their leader breaks out before them, and they all break through the gate and escape. All oh, this, this, this horrible uh, church that turned away from God. If you look at Matthew 7 and verse 14, it says, Straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads into life. They, they got out that gate, that narrow gate, that straight, difficult gate. And God is now protecting them. Verse 13 of Matthew 7 says, Enter you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. See, God says, look, you're going to have to go through the straight gate. There's a lot of work that has to be done. And we have to be doers. Go in that straight gate and deliver God's message to this world. That's the only way to salvation right, right now. It's the only way today or any time for that matter, uh, then, then notice the warning in it of, of Micah 3 and verse 1. And I said here, I pray you, O heads of Jacob, and you princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment? Who hate the good and love the evil, and who pluck out off their skin from off them, and their flesh from off their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people? See, he's talking about the the what is happening to God's own church? They're just being eaten alive spiritually and flay their skin, but it's going to happen physically too. It's dual if they don't wake up, and all of us don't wake up and hearken to God. Look at where we're going. We have to see the path down which we are headed and flay their skin from off of them, and they break their bones and chop them in pieces, and as for the pot, and uh, as flesh within the cauldron. Then shall they cry unto the Eternal, but He will not hear them. He will even hide His face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings." Now that is bad news, but let's look at some of the good news, and it, this ought to really, really uh, refresh your minds. Verse 1 of chapter 4, But in the last days it shall come to pass, that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. People are going to flow into it. Now this, see, all this bad news, news leads right into this. In the last days. See, in that day, in those last days, all of this terrible evil is going to lead right into this most inspiring news you could ever hear. That's what it's all about. Verse 2, And many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Eternal, and to the house of the God of Jacob. And He will teach us His ways, and we will walk in His paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Eternal from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off. God is going to rebuke strong nations, and make them see that now they have to listen to Him. They've had their own way. Now He's going to show them how to make everything beautiful the way it should have been from the beginning. But they decided to follow along with Adam and Eve, and that, look what happened. But notice what's going to happen. He's going to rebuke strong nations, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. 
Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his, his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. Nobody is going to make people afraid anymore. They're going to have their own plot of land and their own fig tree, their own little farm or whatever they want to do with that land. And that nobody's going to make them afraid. Isn't that a wonderful picture of the future? Isn't this just so wonderful and, and refreshing when you realize what is going on in this world today? For the mouth of the eternal of hosts has spoken it. God cannot lie. It has to come to pass. It must happen. It must happen. No, there's no other way that things can uh, develop and conclude. There's just no other way. Notice, here is that one scripture I was talking to you about. Now, this really ought to get our attention if we understand it. It surely is one of the most wonderful scriptures you'll ever read in the Bible. I'll guarantee you that. And it's, uh, it's why man? Why man? What is he here for? Notice this, for all people will walk everyone in the name of his God. Wow, what does that mean? Well, now this is, this is not the eternal God. This is a created God. Notice what it goes on to say, and we will walk in the name of the eternal our God forever and ever. See, that we're walking in the name of the eternal our God, which is the Father and the Son. They're both in unity and, and, and uh, have one mind, really. But here, God says you're, those people in, that are going to be living in the millennium, they're going to, have, they're going to look to their God, His God. Well, the, his God in this area, His God in that area, His God over here, and His God over here, all over the world, God is recreating Himself in man. That's what this verse is saying. And it is a God being that God is creating to solve all these problems in the world. God is going to let them share the throne of David with Jesus Christ, and they're going to rule with Him. God is creating God beings who will help Him rule that wonderful world tomorrow. Now, that, that's a scripture that I, I hope you'll stop and think about. And we have a book on the incredible human potential. You need to write for it. It'll explain all that to you. It's a full booklet, or book, excuse me. See, first, gods are uh, created. God is recreating Himself in man. And they literally become God beings. Mr. Herbert Armstrong wrote that now came the crowning pinnacle of even God's unmatched creative power. Now came the very zenith of all divine accomplishment. Now came a project so incredulously, transcendentally awesome, it is hard for the human mind to grasp. God was going to create Himself in man. Well, how about that? God's greatest masterpiece. He is recreating Himself in man. That was in a Royal Vision article by Mr. Herbert Armstrong. He talked about it being that super vital, vital truism. He said, Now God's purpose through man is to recreate Himself, to reproduce Himself. This is the most wonderful, the most great thing that even God can possibly imagine and undertake to do. And I want to tell you, God... Uh, has his hands full trying to do that, trying to make God persons out of us, because we simply want to go the way of get and not the way of cooperate and give and help and love. See, we have these feelings and these little uh, feelings that rule us, actually. But it goes on here to say that uh, in verses 11 and 12, of Micah 2, that I will surely assemble, O Jacob, and I will surely gather the remnant of Israel, and I will put them together as the sheep of Basra, as the flock in the midst of the fold, and they shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. <laughs> They're going to make great noise. <laughs> Certainly we have TV all over the U.S. and, and much of Canada and uh, in Britain and uh, New Zealand. In other places, in Philippines, 
other places in the world. We really are making a noise, and God says that's the way it has to be in this end time. Make a noise, make a real noise. Cry out and tell my people of their sins. Tell them. That's what that noise is all about. Blow a, an alarm, a, a, a terrifying message here has to be delivered, but look at the end of it. It's so wonderful. I mean, God is trying to, giving us the greatest opportunity you could ever imagine as doing everything to challenge you and help you see your extraordinary potential. Now that is something to really study into, and you'll be blessed as you do that. Until next week, this is Gerald Flurry. Goodbye, friends. It is a gripping story of mass rebellion inside God's own church. It is an epic tale of a tiny loyal remnant fighting head to head against corrupt church leadership and winning. It is the biblical book of Micah. This prophecy foretells of a man who would shepherd a little flock through this betrayal. Jesus Christ said, you shall know them by their fruits. This truth applies to a prophet of God. A true prophet won't necessarily have millions of followers or expensive assets, but he will have a unique understanding of biblical prophecy. God reveals the meaning of the Bible's many end time prophecies to a specific individual today. He gives this man a powerful work to help him deliver these prophecies to the world. Can you prove who he is? Request our free booklet, Who Is That Prophet? to learn the identity of a man prominently mentioned throughout the Bible in both the Old and New Testaments. You need to humbly and prayerfully study who is that prophet to discover where God dwells today. God's loyal remnant broke away from a rebellious church nearly 30 years ago. Request our free book, Raising the Ruins, to learn what happened to the global humanitarian empire of Herbert W. Armstrong. In short, Mr. Armstrong's successors destroyed his worldwide work, smeared his legacy, sold church property, and hoarded the money. But this story has a happy ending. Of all the groups to lead the worldwide Church of God, only one fought for Mr. Armstrong's writings and reputation in a life and death court battle. Only one is raising the ruins of his demolished work today. Read this inspiring story by ordering a free copy of Raising the Ruins.